Possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Wow. It's over the bar. Hello everyone and welcome along to our latest episode of the RTGAA podcast. Myself and Rory will be joined by Kieran Whelan a little bit later on to look back on the final round of football matches. But Neil McManus is with us first to reflect on the Hurling League semi-finals. How are you, Neil? Do you enjoy your weekend of Hurling? I did, I did. Uh, two really interesting games, Jagger. And uh, look, I think we obviously got a surprise um, with Limerick, Limerick exiting. But uh, that does no harm. That spaces it up a little bit. And uh, I think that, you know, on the whole, we get two decent games um, when pitch conditions and, and one of the games and weather for both were, were poor at times. Mm. I think it's funny, Rory, maybe the hurling public were crying out for, not necessarily for Limerick to be beaten, but I do think you have everybody kind of engaged in it now saying, oh, maybe there is a, you know, a little chink in the armour, which I think the hurling people maybe are glad to see somebody else at the table. I don't know now if everybody wants Claire to win it or whether they want <laughs> Kilkenny to win it, but I still think a, a bit of difference is no harm either. Yeah, and I saw somebody mention the fact that it's the first time that Claire Kilkenny are going to meet in a league final since 2005, which yeah. brings a real novelty to the pairing in a in league final context. It'll be interesting to see where they fix it for. So I'm not sure if Turles is still out of action, but... I think it was um, it was a brilliant result in many ways on Saturday, given the fact that it then really meant that Claire Tip could go after the game on Sunday. So it added a level of honesty to the proceedings on in the second semi final, which I think was important because it, look, the reality is, had Limerick won, you'd you would have really wondered where Claire and Tip would have been in terms of wanting to play Limerick in a in a in a, in a league final so soon to the Munster Championship yeah. starting in a couple of weeks' time. So I think. It was the perfect result on Saturday in some ways. It was the perfect result for John Coyley as well in some ways. And it, I think everybody, it was like, it was like, a, there was a little bit for everyone, you know? Mm, yeah. Um, so yeah. I think, I think from that point of view, they, they was, uh, it was a good, it was a good day. I don't know John Coyley described the important, the performance is embarrassing. I don't know if I'd be that strong. I think it was a message really to his players insofar as like, it wasn't really acceptable from their point of view. Mm, they were they, 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 it, it was unusual to see them so lethargic I think was the word Liam Sheedy described but sure look we don't know whether or not they had been flogged during the week with one mind to putting in a body of work ahead of when the championship starting so soon mm. they conceded I think when you're watching some of the goals that Kilkenny scored, I thought they could have scored six or seven goals, Neil. And I think, you know, when you're listening to John Kiley using words like embarrassed and he's saying it was one of the worst performances of my time, you know, they're the things that he's going to be looking at saying we could have got, they, they did get a bit of a hiding, but he said it was eight points that could have felt like 16 or 20 points. That like it certainly was one of his lowest points as Limerick manager. It has to be. It definitely could have been 12 anyway, Jaggy, because, you know, Limerick had, 14, 15 ways themselves. So they had plenty of opportunities, but they're hurling in general. They're ball to hand. They're, you know, winning rucks, the really basic stuff that Limerick generally dominate. And I thought it was really interesting, you know, whenever you're looking at the stats afterwards and you're seeing that pog outs, uh, one of the opposition and of your own was really similar. Possession, I think, was 50 50 as well. And, Kil and Kilkenny are. Now you can't hit, or they did to Limerick, what Limerick generally do to everybody else, mm. and that's sweep up and win nearly every uh, break, and they got they got dominated in that regard. And I would say John Kelly maybe was a little bit embarrassed. They had to remove, you know, Cian Lynch. He had to sub off Declan Hannon. He had to sub off Galan as well. And I know he he would have been getting minutes back into Declan Hannon as well, so he maybe didn't intend for him to play the full seventy, but. Uh, I, I would think he's he was genuine in his uh, post-match analysis. I think he would think that it's not good enough. He would feel that he's trying to blood some new players into the team and he would feel that the performance from his leaders, his on-field generals, simply wasn't good enough. He, he, small things like John Donnelly catching a ball over Dermot Burns. Who, who do we ever see catching a ball over Dermot Burns? Keane Lynch getting turned over two or three times in the first half and that leading to one of the goals. Uh, those things, even, I think it was around 57, 58 minutes, 
you see Adrian Mullen chasing down Nicky Quaid like his life depended upon it to turn him over and win a free for Kilkenny. That's the stuff that we really do and have been associating with Limerick for the past four or five years. So um, I would say John was genuine in his frustration after the game. Do you think he has enough to be worried about or is it a sense of this can be turned around very quickly? Because, I mean, look, it is Limerick. You mentioned Sean Finn getting back, Declan Hannan. There's lots of them who are on a different road right now. So how panicked should John Kiley be? Uh Panic, I don't think, is a word that can be in the same sentence as John Kelly. Um, he's he's too experienced, he's too successful for that. He'll also know that, look, Kilkenny really targeted Aaron Costello when in the edge of the square, Owen uh, Cody got himself in one-on-one with him, TJ got himself in one-on-one with him, but they have Mike Casey to return, they have Dan Morrissey to return, and like Sean Finn's not a three, he's the best cornerback in the game, but he's not a three, so... There was an imbalance in the Limerick fullback line. And Kilkenny, fair play to them, because not everybody could do it. Kilkenny went after them and did target goals. So, but whenever those those two lads joined Sean Finn in there, that's a totally different fullback line. Um, no, I don't think he'll panic at all. I think he'll take the positives, actually. He'll say, look at Cahill O'Neill here, lads. This is his first year getting a run of games. He was the, you know, he could arguably have been man of the match himself. He was phenomenal. Two points from play. He's there already. He's their ball carrier of choice from defence and he's electric going forward with it. Um, Nicky Quaid was obviously exceptional, far too busy for John Kay, yeah. like him, but <laughs> he was brilliant. Um, so I, I think he'll take the positives out of it and say, look, this is the standard we need to come up to again. Um, and I, I would say he'll think one day off over the past sort of three or four years, it's not too bad. Yeah, in fairness, Rory, <laughs> it's one trophy. It's certainly not the most important one and I think I heard John Kiley say the league final was in our plans. So we're going to have to reassess. So he definitely wanted to win. There's no question that they'd overworked and they weren't interested in being there. So he is going to have to reassess somehow. It just it's a case of how big of a hit this is to this group. Yeah, but I don't I don't think it will. Um, I mean, by the time the Munster Championship starts in a couple of weeks time, this will all exactly. well, be, well, be well forgotten about um, once the vista of Ennis and as I was saying before Dale was describing Savage Sunday where Limerick and Clare will meet I think all of this will be old hat by then I think from their point of view a couple of small things that will probably annoy him another sending off uh, which was and deserved a re- and, a, and a real pe- and a real petulant silly one this time I mean We've seen some sendings off where you go, look, that one was probably a bit harsh. Like, if I was John Kiley, I'd be very annoyed with Peter in, on this occasion. Like, I mean, And he said it straight afterwards, to be fair, John. He, he said yeah. it was a sending off. So now you're, like, I would imagine he will be suspended for that first match. And then you have to reshuffle. He would have been a, a Peter Casey. You would have assumed, no, Donica Darling is obviously in there and he'll give them options in terms of Aaron Galan, Seamus Flanagan. So it's not going to weaken them massively given the performances that he's put in over the course of the league. But at the same time, it's again, it's another suspension, another distraction, another example of maybe a loose, um, a looseness around their discipline, which I suppose other teams would probably say, look, this is something that you could go after. But look, the reality from a point from Limerick's perspective is they've proven so many times in the past when even went down to 14, it hasn't really seemed to affect them all that much. But I think, yeah, I think there'd, there'd be plenty to work on. Getting the mindset right will be their biggest challenge, given the fact that they're chasing so much history. But I think I don't know if they'll dwell too much on mm-hmm. what happened on Saturday night. I think it was definitely a performance on the back of a hard week of training. That's what it looked to me. And I think in fairness to the lads last night on TV, that's what they seem to suggest as well. Mm. What about Kilkenny then, Neil? Because to me, it looks like they've found a blueprint that works. I thought their physicality their you know, apart from maybe butchering a few goal chances, I think Derek Ling will be absolutely thrilled with what he's seen. Can they replicate this later in the year? That's the biggest question for Kilkenny. It really is, but Kilkenny will be delighted with the performance. They'll be delighted they're in a league final because, you know, the Leinster Championship doesn't have, uh, you know, the quality that the Munster Championship has. So Kilkenny can go hell for leather uh, in the league final um, without too, too many concerns. That won't be the same for Clare. But I think just the honesty and the team performance, like you look through it, Hugh Lawler, Paddy Deegan, uh, Blanchfield, 
TJ, Adrian Mullen, they were all exceptional. John Donnelly was actually probably the pick of them, uh, in my opinion. They, Their leaders are standing up, and the younger lads who have broke through, which is, you know, there, there's quite a few have something to follow there in that, so he, he'll be delighted. And even, we noticed this uh, in a previous round of the league, and we noticed it again yesterday. Derek Ling has replaced... Um, somebody at half time who's been underperforming in nearly every game now it was Killian Buckley uh, yesterday he was turned over for a goal and a point in quick succession we didn't see him again after half time that happened to Richie Reid uh, in the league previous and there's a little bit of the Brian Cody's about that you know like yeah we might be going yeah. really well and most managers would say don't change it we're flying let's not get in our own road here but he said no that's not to the standard you're out Um that sends a, a message through the team, so it does, and I it really does look like everybody's buying in and fighting so hard for him, and it was it was quite a, a typical Kilkenny performance. In fairness, loads of work rate, um, but they they have stuff to work on too because you can't spurn that number of goal chances uh, in in those big games because that number will come down to two or three goal chances in the entire game whenever Limerick have the full squad back. Mm. I thought it was I thought it was interesting, Jackie, though the analogy and comparison that Neil made with Derek Ling and his predecessor and sometimes when you're listening to Derek Ling in post-match press in, it, whenever he speaks if you closed your eyes it could almost be Brian Cody <laughs> it's just in terms of delivery in terms of demeanor in terms of non-nonsense just the usual non-negotiables when it comes to Kilkenny there are non-negotiables always with Kilkenny and that is work rate who can block and giving everything leaving leaving it all out there uh, if they're beaten by the better team on the day then in terms of all of those aspects and if the another team has a little bit of extra X factor and a little bit of extra skill that ultimately sees them uh, not win they accept that they move on like there's just uh, yeah like there's there's an awful lot to be admired as much as it pains me to say it Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, listen you couldn't let that one pass yeah. I, I do wonder though Rory how they set up now against Clare who are a different mm. kind of a challenge to Limerick again and it probably is a free shot for both of them but maybe Kilkenny might feel for the reasons that Neil has outlined that they can have a right go off this because they can take the foot off the pedal a small bit after a league final for those reasons well, well it's a, a very very interesting question because if you go back to the league encounter in Ennis a couple of weeks ago 18 points apiece now it was very physical Jackie extremely physical it, there was it was a real war of attrition can Brian Lohan allow that type of game to go again I think Brian Lohan will because I think Lohan in his personality loves that type of game I think Claire love it but it's a risky one if you're going to get into the trenches and you want to get into hand-to-hand -hand stuff with Kilkenny, you are running a major, major risk here. So, so close to the Munster Championship. So, it's it, to me, it makes for a very intriguing uh, uh, clash of styles. And will we see another game where both teams wake up on Sunday morning quite sore? I think we probably will. Um, um, yeah, it, 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 I think it lends an honesty as well. The fact that the two teams are unlikely to meet until obviously deep into the championship. I think they'll both go for it. Um, they both probably need a league title. It's been a while since either county has won something significant, you know. So look, I think it's it, it, it'll make for a very, very interesting game. Can't wait to see it. And it should be, should finish off what has been, look, let's be honest, a very nondescript league campaign in, in an overall context. Poor crowds, poor engagement, you know, obviously everybody waiting for the championship to come around. I think, look, at least we're getting a final that can sort of bookend this and, you know, give us something to look forward to. Yeah. And look, I think early on, we probably thought Clare were kind of the team of the league, Neil. So it's not a surprise that they're in a league final because I think Brian don't, Brian Lowen will be happy with the effort that he's seen. And, you know, Rory's right. A league title would mean a lot to the people of Clare because it's a long time since they've had silverware like that. So there's no reason for them not to go to it. How, what sort of shape do you think they're in? I think they're in fantastic shape. Mm. I really think they've improved. Um, Rory and I were having a... a a difference of opinion on who is the number team, uh, number two team chasing Limerick uh, at the start of the league. And Rory was saying he feels it's Clare. And I said, for me, it's still Kilkenny. Um, mm. 
Kenny have won the last two semi finals. Then obviously Claire turned them over uh, in Ennis, but this will really tell us. So yeah. well, who who is the who's the number one challenger for for the throne? But I just the way that Claire are playing. Claire have added to their panel. Claire are missing three, four, and five of of fairly substantial names every day they go out, and it doesn't look like it. Uh, like Jeremy Ryan and Davy Fitz, there they are absolute colossus uh, for them in around the middle third. Now they look like a team who have really found a rhythm and they almost hurled with the personality of their manager and, and Brian Lohan you know nearly the worse the conditions the better they enjoy it and then they're they're, they're well fit for the the nice fresh summertime hurling too so I think Claire will go at it and I agree with her I think Claire really want the league title it's different in Kilkenny Kilkenny have won the last four or five Leinster championships on the bounce so they are used to uh, winning a little bit of silverware but Claire probably needed a little bit more just for the younger players to understand that okay, we're here now. There's a chance we can drive this thing on, and I I think I think Claire are absolutely flying. I think that championship being so close is actually a positive for them, and they'll want to carry that momentum straight into the twenty first against Limerick. They seem to have found the scoring power that maybe they lacked in previous years. And I know they've always had out and out, smart, speedy forwards. But even in someone like Aidan McCarthy, they seem oh, yeah. to have, you know, 90 percent plus um, range where they're just I, I don't know. There just seems to be something different about them this year. I don't know how much closer they are to Limerick and whether they are the number two team. I think you're right. Maybe we are going to see it. But there's something different about them this year. Well, even even the fact that Brian Lohan is content to keep Aidan McCarthy in the bench in case he needs him, and everybody needs the panel now. That you think of the impact. Remember, Mark Rogers went off. He had Aidan McCarthy on the bench who could come on. He nailed every free yeah. that, he, that he got whenever he came on. I think it was five out of five, and we all know what was happening with the temporary frees on the, at the other end of the field. So that's important. That's really smart from Brian Lohan. The other thing is, you know, the, the impact that the, the Galvins have had is, is huge. You know, we didn't see a pile of them last year. Look, I, I just think he's building a real panel. And you're talking about the firepower that we've seen from him during the league. That's without Shane O'Donnell, yeah. without Tony Kelly, you know. Like, and even, I love the way they've learned from Limerick. Claire have learned from Limerick. Garoud Hegarty for Limerick, he challenges an awful lot of the long pog outs. But in open play, he's right back the field in his own half opening up space in front of Aaron Galan. Watch Peter Duggan. Watch his performance just yesterday, but he's been doing it all league. He's up there winning ball in the opposition half, handing it off. He's not usually the shooter, but then he's going way back the field to open up space in front of the full forward line. And it's great whenever you see somebody who's just thought, okay, I'm going to learn from this. I'm not going to be annoyed about it. And I really like what Brian Lohan's done this year. Mm. They're still the number two for you, Rory, anyway. Yeah, big time, I think. And they will get stronger. Um, I, I, like, I mean, I think if you get injured and you lose your place, you mightn't get it back. I think he's got so much depth now. I think one of the big things that Claire might, like people might have thrown at Claire in, in, in a historical context is they would never put do enough damage on the scoreboard. They have plenty of scoring forwards. They're a very reliable free taker. They will get goals. They'd probably need to score a few more. Uh, I think that will definitely be something that will come into play if Shane O'Donnell comes back into the mix and certainly Tony Kelly. No, we don't know how serious those injuries are and how fit they'll be for throwing straight back into the sort of hellfire kitchen situation that Munster Championship will be. But I think all across the team, Cahill Malone, David Fitzgerald, like they, 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 even Daryl Owen, I think, uh, Brian's nephew, I think, like they, they, he's added so many players to what's all, so many players that have like been absolute mainstays and improved year on year. There's always a really good spirit about Clare. I mean, I was just looking back there just in terms of their record in the Munster Championship. It's outstanding. So, like, they they have been very, very consistent. I suppose their problem is they have just not gotten over the line for any of the big trophies. The Munster Championship, they haven't won since 1998. I think that's a big uh, thorn in the back of their, in, in their shoes. So they have a chance now to put national silverware on the table. And I think it would be something that would justify the merits of their efforts so far under low and I think it would be important for them to go on and win it. Mm. 
One last question on Tipperary, Neil, because, look, the game was kind of gone after 10, 11 minutes. They were eight points down. They somehow managed to kind of drag themselves back into it. But I think for Liam Cal, he's got to be a little bit concerned that they're not putting themselves in positions to win these games. You know, it's another big chance gone. And yeah, their, their development has been stalled again at a point when Tipperary public just really need this team to, to progress. I, I was at their game uh, against Antrim in the previous round. Um, and Antrim, well, actually, great news for Antrim. Antrim were getting about 10 players back. It's wonderful to see what a, a warm weather training camp will do for you, <laughs> yeah. but uh, which is looming. But I wasn't massively impressed, to be honest. No, conditions weren't great that day. But, you know, they, they, they didn't shoot the lights out and they had plenty of their, their first team on, on show. And it, like, I can't see where the goals are going to come from, mm. you know, if Jake Morris doesn't get them. Uh, uh, like, I would worry for Tipperary, to be totally honest. I, I think there's going to be an absolute dogfight in Munster for that third spot, you know, between Waterford, Cork and Tip. Um, I do think, yeah, Clare and Limerick do look stronger than everybody else. But I'm, I'm not sure if they know who is going to play where. You know, Robert Byrne back in at centre-back again. I'm not sure that that's the answer. It's... It's a really tough position for Liam Cahill um, because I think, as the guy said last night in TV, the chopping and changing of the free taker really almost summed up their their league. It was out of sorts. It was inconsistent. There was no real leader. Like They have Jason Ford there. I, I would encourage Liam Cahill to say, Jason Ford is one of the best free takers in the country. He might miss one or two. Everybody misses one or two at some stage, but he's our free taker. You know, they switched on to Garoud. He missed a couple. Um, Wally Connors had a couple at one stage. And and then Sean came off the bench and he had a couple of goals. You know, it was like something you see in an under-16 match. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I think there's there's definitely issues um, to be one, solved there. Yeah, but the one thing though, Jackie, is they have time to do it. They yeah. have they have five weeks until they have to go to the Gaelic grounds to play Limerick, which is, given the fact that... No, the, the, from yesterday, they have no more competitive hurling. They can kind yeah. of go away nice and quietly in behind closed doors, try and sort that out, try and sort all of that out. They have a bye week on the first week of the Monster Championship. I don't think they're out until the 28th or the 29th of that, that, that week anyway, the second week of the Round Robin series. So it gives them time. And it'll also give them an opportunity to sit back and have a look at what happens on week one. And I think it'll give them an opportunity maybe to get a few injuries tidied up few selection issues tidied up. Free taking is obviously, as the lads pointed out and Neil just mentioned, is an issue. Just goes to show the value of Shamey Cal all those years and how important he was to them. So, um, but look, it, it's temporary. You know? Yeah. It's, you know, I wouldn't be feeling too sorry for yeah. him. <laughs> <laughs> right. Come here. One last thing, Neil, I did want to ask you about before we finish up on the hurling. We did see, obviously, the new rules coming into play at the weekend. And I think the helmet one is going to be quite interesting where we saw Carl O'Neill punished on the weekend where the new rule comes into play. The minute a player takes his helmet off, he has to leave the field of play and he's not allowed back on to play until the referee has a break in play and then allow them back on. It is going to stop people taking taken off their helmets, rightly or wrongly, whether, I, I don't know whether it was being used as a delay tactic, which seems to be one suggestion, or whether if somebody does have a serious head injury and they need to be assessed, it's probably a good thing. H how do you see this, this being managed as the summer goes on? Do you think this is a good thing? A huge positive, Jack. I think that the game was being deliberately stopped whenever the opposition were uh, getting into a better flow, they were creating a better momentum. I, and look, we want to see hurling flow. That's what makes it so good. So once players' uh, safety isn't at risk, then this is fine. And no player is at any risk standing on the side of the field. So, look, I think the GA have got this one bang on um, in terms of the helmet rule. If you take your own helmet off and you lie down, maybe there's something seriously wrong with you, so we need to get you off. And maybe you're also, or maybe you're, you're doing it because you want to break up the play a little bit. So you should be punished for that. And... That's how this rule is going to work from from what I can uh, from what I can see. With Neil, could I ask, right? And I, uh, look, player welfare and player safety is paramount, and we all accept that. And we would all maybe accept that people were abusing the scenario where you could take a helmet off, maybe to do uh, to, to you know to time waste, break up momentum for teams under pressure. But what we have seen is goalkeepers do it quite regularly, right? So what happens if a goalkeeper does it? 
I, I think the goalkeeper should be sent from the field um, to be reviewed by the medical staff and you have to shift your pack. Your full back has to go in the nets and you have to bring a corner forward out to midfield and a midfielder back and that will very quickly cut out the time wasting and the messing. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I tell you, I'd love to see the first team who are going to chance that then, because there's, <laughs> that is not going to happen. You know, it just, I, I do think, look, in fairness to the GAA, the one thing is they have spotted an area that has been problematic in slowing down a game. And so rightly or wrongly, whether if somebody needs treatment, they're going to get off. And if somebody is delaying, then we're all going to get a faster game. I think they should be applauded for that, in fairness, because player welfare is absolutely paramount here. But we also want to protect the integrity of the game deal. You know, you want to stop people from trying to cheat and whatever in any way that they can. And maybe cheat's too strong a word, but I do think if, if somebody's abusing the rules, they should be called out for it. 100%. And this is now we have a clear direction for referees to follow. And that's really important for them because they have enough to be doing. And you Exactly. Know, we heard enough about referees over the weekend, so they'll they'll be the net beneficiary of this rule. I think our referees, and you know, we've got the fastest field game in the earth. Let's let it let's let it fly. Yeah, wait till we start bringing in three or four refs, lads. I tell you, we'll change it all. <laughs> uh, okay, right, we'll leave the hurling there, but um, really brilliant league final to look forward to. Yeah. So, Neil, thanks a million for being with us. Thanks, Shaggy. Thanks, Rory. All right, we're going to chat football now and Kieran Whelan is with us to review a busy weekend of league action. So just to recap for anybody who has missed it or, or hasn't seen, you've got a Dublin Derry Division 1 league final, Roscommon and Monaghan relegated. Division 2 final between Donegal and Armagh, Fermanagh and Kildare relegated. Down in Westmeath promoted from Division 3, Wicklow and Limerick relegated and Leash and Leitrim promoted from Division 4. All action in Division 1 and we probably knew everything really coming into the weekend, Kieran Barr, who was going to be playing Derry in a league final so maybe Dublin when they started out the year might have thought league final wasn't necessarily in their plans but how will Desi be feeling about being in it now at this position? Yeah I think Jackie like it's probably the biggest positive out of, out, the positive out of Division 1 is that we're left with an absolutely brilliant final next weekend and uh, you know because let's be honest I think you can separate and you can have Division 2 Division 3 and Division 4 but Division 1 has some way been devalued this year with the, with the championship and there was definitely a sense even from managers interviews over the last few weeks that you know they all just wanted to get safe and there was like it was really the league that they weren't really yeah if we got to the final and we want to be competitive laddie now we don't want to be relegated like there was a lot of kind of uh, I, I don't like using the word shadow boxing but you know a bit of nonsense talk going on and I suppose we've been left with a situation where we possibly have the two form teams in the final. Yeah. And we're left in a situation where you would expect Mickey Hart will come and, you know, not like the league game a few weeks ago, he had put out as his str strongest team. Uh, he always wants to be back in Crow Park. He sees this as a massive rehearsal for later in the year. Um, it's his first rodeo with Derry into Crow Park. And Desi Farrell on the other side, I'd say, you know, after the first two league games, Dublin were probably worrying about trying to just get safe and all of a sudden they've stumbled into a final. Their performances have been excellent. The, the real boost for Desi Farrell is that, you know, there was a lot of guys that he was giving game time to over the last couple of years and particularly last year in the kind of faded outcome championship. They've done really well in this league campaign, um, they've, and they've and and it does. I think I think it's something we really forget that it does take time to. You need time and experience in the intercounty jersey to really develop your confidence and your composure and stuff like that. And you know, some of those players were playing last year and probably taking wrong options and under a lot of pressure and didn't have a lot of confidence. And all of a sudden, they're playing with that confidence, with that composure. And you know, the likes of Lorcan and Odell and Ross McGarry and. You know, Keen Murphy and Sean McMahon, they've all really kind of had really good league campaigns, which is a huge positive. And I think Desi's in a very good situation next week because he can nearly go in and test their metal now in that environment with the comfort of knowing that he might have Cluxton, Fitzsimons, Mannion, McCaffrey, McCarthy all to come back. <laughs> so he can really offer them a good test, if you know what I mean. It's a, it's a great place for Dublin to be in, to be honest, because, you know, if if you look at the last league game, similarly, they'll have an excuse coming out of it. Do you know what I mean? If it doesn't go well, are we still have lads to come back? So exactly, I, I, I think he'd be, I think it's a brilliant game for Dublin next week to be able to go in and say, right, Derry are coming a full tilt. And in fairness to Derry, you know, we're disappointed that they didn't maybe put out the full team up in Celtic Park. They will next week, but aside from 
the Kerry and Dublin game, they've beaten everybody very, very consistent. Like they've been very consistent. They've been comfortable. Their game plan has, has I think, has changed a lot under Mickey Hart. They're not like if you go back and look at them the last couple of years, they sat, sat so deep. Now they're really playing front foot football. They're pushing out. They still have the best defensive record in the league, despite a change of kind of game plan and strategy. They're very, very good to watch. And I'm I I, I think it's one to wet the appetite. I think yeah. next weekend is going to be brilliant. And I, I'm I'm all for league finals. I think it's it, I think it's a great weekend and uh it, it's really, really uh, a game looking forward to now. Mm. I, I, I think this will be an intriguing league final for all of those reasons, Rory. You know, these are the two best teams in the country playing the best football. They're being rewarded for it. And they've got a chance to go toe to toe in a league final for Silverware and Croke Park. Like, I understand people saying they don't want the league final. But if you'd have offered us at the start of the year to have the two best teams at the moment playing, that's a great advertisement for football. Brilliant. Yeah. Like, I mean, the things that we missed out on when Derry uh, obviously rested a few players. We should see Chrissy McCaig versus Conor Callaghan. I mean, who wouldn't want to watch that? We should see Conor Glass versus Brian Fenton. Who's not going to want to watch that? Yeah. And then Shane McGuigan at the other end. Who picks him up? That'll be an interesting decision to make there from a Dublin perspective. And Fitzy won't be back in time. If it was, Dublin picking from full strength, you'd imagine that's probably what would happen. It would be Michael Fitzsimons, but he probably won't play. So that's a really interesting subplot as well. Dublin, Dublin are frightening. I think Dublin are frightening. I mean, I know Wheelo mentioned they're stumbled. I think they did a bit more stumble into a final. I think they've stormed into it. And I think they are putting the heebie-jeebies up and pretty much everybody else. Uh, when you consider the strength and depth they have, the quality of their play, the speed with which they can destroy teams. So I think that's the big difference for me watching that game, particularly yesterday and a few of their previous matches. Dublin do everything that all the other teams do, but they do it just so much faster, so much quicker. There's so much pace right across the team in their half back line, in their in their in in midfield, in their in their middle eight in particular, and the damage that they can do in such a short period of time. It's almost hurling esque, and then when you ha- when you're led with this, with the fulcrum of their attack, with a sort of a generational talent like someone like Conor Callaghan, I think. Look, I think it, hopefully this game is competitive because the way Dublin are absolutely dismantling teams at the minute, it may very well not be. It, D- D- Dublin could win it, and ap- I, I, I don't, I don't think they will destroy Derry, but they could. Ah, uh, no, no. The best I defensive record. Yeah, I, I think like they, they have been absolutely top drawer, right? And 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 really kind of I think probably surprised even a lot of people, you know, in Dublin. And and and, and I suppose the the nervousness you nearly have is that you know, you, you hear people now in Dublin, they think it's you know they're all our intellect champions, you know what I mean? And that that's a that's a that's a that's a very dangerous place to be. Um I do think Derry will I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be overly reading into too much yesterday. They were brilliant again yesterday, but Tyrone was kind of disappointing again with Tyrone yeah. coming down to wave the white flag and say, you know, we're not going to put out our full team. You know, that I, that to me is a poor enough excuse. Uh, but I do think that Derry are, for me, are, 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 are at it. Like, if you look at the league in its whole, it turned out entirely predictable, you know, and mm. I think there was, there was, a, there was a distinct gap in that division between, you know, Derry, Dublin, Kerry, and possibly the rest, you know, Mayo filtering somewhere in between. But, you know, there was a distinct gap, I think. Um, and and that's why I just think Derry will will come and be very will be more competitive they'll ask questions of Dublin. But I fully agree with you, Rory, hundred percent that the pace which Dublin are playing the game, how they can mix it up, um, you know, in terms of their running game, their counterattack, they kick the ball. You know that just that 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 intensity they're playing with is is very very difficult to to counteract, and um, mm. and it will be very interesting. How did Derry approach them? Do Derry come? Like, like, Derry may Derry have... come like Kerry and say, right, we'll meet you man to man, and mm. let's see who comes out on top, or will they be a little bit more conservative? And sometimes when you're a little bit more conservative against Dublin, it can hurt you because they, yeah. you know, they they know how to get around that. And there are so few teams, Jackie, in my view, that have the athleticism to actually match Dublin. I think Mayo, funnily enough, are one of those teams. But Mayo, where Mayo come up short, is generally they don't put enough on the scoreboard. But exactly. in an athlete, in an in an athletic sense, 
that's the first job that you have when you're playing Dublin. They're always in unbelievable shape. They're, they're their SNC, whoever's doing it, you know, fair play to them. So you're going to have to match them in that sense. Now, maybe Derry will be able to stick with them. Maybe. I mean, like, what's your, what's the, you know, they went up to Celtic Park uh, during the league, won comfortably okay. Derry obviously, you know, played uh, maybe a weakened team. But even if you go back to last year's league, I know it was Division 2, but it was the same two teams. I mean, Dublin eviscerated them. So, like, I don't necessarily see Dublin storming off into the sunset and basically nobody being able to keep the ball kicked out to them in, throughout the course of the entire championship. They will get tests somewhere along the line. I, I, can I listen, I think can I, can I see any? Can I see anyone beating them? I don't. I, I'm telling you now, right? The talk that Rory is giving you there is a cork man living in Dublin, Kieran. And if he is that optimistic about Dublin, imagine what the dubs actually yeah. feel about them. Well, so, he's, pick, he's picking up Jackie and all this sense of all this talk that it's you know the All Ireland is a done deal and all this sort of you know, and that's 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 like it's an unhealthy. That's why I think it's worrying. I really do because I just think Derry are. They, they're they're different than last year. And look, they went toe to toe with Kerry, who play a similar style of football, that front style of football again last year, and arguably should have beaten Kerry last year. I think Mickey Hart is a wily enough character, and I think they'll give Dublin plenty, lads. I I, I really do. We hope. I just look. I just. I, 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 I listen. It's a it's yeah. a brilliant final, and yeah, it is. It's a brilliant game for Dublin because look, listen, they they're they're. They're sauntering into a Leinster Championship and it doesn't exactly. look like there's much in there that's yeah. going uh, to, to rattle their cage. So it's a really, really good test for for a great game for Dublin to get at this time of year. And it's, as he said, it's Mickey Hart's first rodeo into Crow Park with, 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 with Derry. So I think it's brilliant. Actually, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be, you know, unfortunately after next weekend where we slide back into provincial championships. But anyway, <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> uh, well, give me the contenders then behind them, then, Kieran, how you see it, right? So if you've got Derry Dublin stand out, there's a gap between them and and everybody else maybe at the moment. Where do you rate Kerry, Mayo, Tyrone, Galway, Donegal, Armagh? Where are you seeing the other contenders based on the league right now? Well, Kerry are obvious contenders, Jackie. They have to come into the equation, you know what I mean? And, you know, that performance in Crow Park and, 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 and in some ways... You know, I know Eamon touched on it last week. He was 100% right. Jack O'Connor be happy to get 10 points and head off to the sun. Uh, you know, it, 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 that did he want to be coming up maybe to play Dublin in Crow Park? It might have, might have been Derry, obviously. But uh, I, I think it's how Kerry have dealt with that psychological blow of that league game, just the manner of it and how Dublin absolutely dismantled them. And and I think that's the real test. That's we won't get the answers to that, but Kerry are going to be extremely competitive. And you can see that they've worked a lot more on their defensive structure since that game. Um, you know, there's been there's been positives in their play. Obviously, they left the Cliffords out yesterday. They 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 still, you know, like Sadara Roach, Killian Spillane came in, got a couple of scores. Joe Connor had a very good game in the middle of the park yesterday. That's an area where they're definitely looking to improve and get more from. So Kerry are definitely in the equation. They're sneaking around. Mayo, um, you know, Mayo, it's 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 very, very hard to call, you know. Um they it's don't, a very odd league. Yeah, it's a strange it, league campaign yeah, for Mayo, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, very strange league campaign. You still worry, you know, have they got it up top? Have they got have they got the, the players, the, the the forwards that are going to be needed when it really comes to it? Have we seen can they break down defenses in an effective manner? Not really. We haven't seen a whole lot for them. But you know what? They might suit Kevin. He might be quite happy just to be in that position. But, you know, after that, you're back to Galway then. And Galway, you know, struggling, as we know, you know, they're not going to be competitive unless they get their best players back on the pitch. Simple as that. And you're running out of time. And you can't just saunter straight back into a team. You need game, games under your belt. You need to get that sharpness back. So it, it the, the, the outlook doesn't look good for them. And then, you know, Roscommon, they have a plan A, but they've no plan B. And they have a they have a game plan where they're able to kind of restrict teams and stay in the game. But when they have to push out and they have to play football or they slip behind, their weaknesses are exposed and and and, and they're not going to compete with the top teams. Uh, and then Monon, to their credit, have performed quite well, you know, probably a little bit unlucky, uh, put in some good performances. So probably where the other danger comes, Jackie, to answer that question is is the Donegal, the Armas. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because they're the ones with momentum. Uh, you know, Armagh have had a really, really good league campaign and all they only conceded the two goals at the, the weekend against uh Cork, but and and, and Donegal, and and that's that's the other benefit of next weekend. Like it it has a sense of 
two Division One finals, if you know what I mean. Uh, like, you know, you've got to feel that our man, Donegal, are probably in the slipstream, uh, even though, you know, you have to be, you have to be very conscious. You look at results and it looks great to be top of the table because the the level of they're playing at and the teams they're playing at. So they haven't, there's probably questions they haven't been asked, but they look like teams that are building momentum uh, for this year and they'll be, they, they'll be knocking around that mid-division at Mayo, I'd say. And I think the fact that Dublin did it last year, Rory, should be a sign to a Donegal and Armagh that that's okay being in the slipstream. If you want to go and rack up huge scores playing in Division 2 football, get the confidence up, you know, I think maybe for both of those teams, given that they have to play in the Ulster Championship, they're going to have to get on it pretty quickly. Maybe that Dublin didn't have to do last year, but I think they'll see that there's a pathway there. Yeah, and division a Division Two league medal. I'm, I'm look from an Armagh perspective. I wouldn't imagine too many lads have won anything at intercounty level. Even the Donegal lads, like it's a while back for their last Ulster Championship win. So you're. You know, so it's an opportunity to get silverware on the board. I think, look, uh, Will and I were speaking about this earlier. Maybe it might have been better had the Division 2 and Division 4 final gone together on the Saturday and the Division 1 and 3 final on the Sunday instead of having three Ulster teams all there on the Sunday. Um, might have just spread the little stardust across the weekend a little bit better. But look, we understand why they do it. There should be a big crowd there. I'd imagine the, the two teams are fairly well supported, particularly Armagh. Brought a massive crowd down to Cork, by the way. Huge. Like, I mean, think of the travel that's involved. And they have incredible support. Fair play to them. Like, I mean, it's an... It's some journey now. You obviously got to stay overnight. And it was a good game, actually, that Cork Armagh match in, in in a lot of ways. And but I think it's been um it's been a good campaign for both of them. I think I suppose the, the only thing is, was there ever any doubt before a ball was kicked that the two of these teams would be the two teams that would come out? There wasn't. Predictable, yeah. You know, so it was maybe a little bit predictable in that sense. And um I think the big surprise in division two is Kildare played seven, lost seven. I think that's probably the biggest headline coming out of Division 2. One little caveat that I would throw into the mix, though, Jackie. In the last couple of years in Division 2, like, for instance, la- this year, everybody more or less said Armagh Donegal would, would come storming back out of it. They have. Last year, obviously, Dublin were in that situation with Derry, and everyone more or less picked them to come out of Division 2. The year before, I think it was Galway and Roscommon went up with them. So it was a team that came down from Division 1, and everyone just said, look, they'll just go straight back up. Next year, and I know next year's a long way away, I think it might be slightly more unpredictable. You know, with Monaghan and Roscommon dropping into Division 2, I think you might have a slightly more democratic. It's not, it's not obvious who's going to come straight back out of it, which will make Division 2 slightly more interesting next year. But look, that's another day still. Yeah, that, that, that is actually interesting, Kiran. because when you think about it, I don't think too many people might have had Kildare on their radar for being relegated. You know, a lot of these teams, the, the fall down from the top tier can be pretty severe. We've seen that with the likes of Westmead down through the years as well. It you know, sometimes that losing stumble can just continue. Yeah, and, you know, Kildare, Jackie, it's been a shock to me for a really hard. It's been, it's been depressing enough now watching them. Um, and you're looking from the outside and you're kind of saying it, it all doesn't appear right just in terms of the body language and whether it's players, management, whether it's county board, you know, who knows? You know, we, we're not privy to what goes on behind the doors, but they're not a team, they're a team that's just not... They're not performing in any shape or form. You know, I looked at them on Saturday night and they were playing with a wind. They sat back and they sat deep. It was like as if they were trying they were trying to stay in the game against Loud. And I know disrespect Loud. J.R. Brennan has done a brilliant job at Loud, but a team that you would expect at their level that they could maybe push out and really kind of try go after. And Loud demonstrated when they turned around the second half. Loud done exactly what Kildare should have done in the first half. And Played aggressively, pushed up the field, put massive pressure on Kildare, pressed the kick out, won, dumped, took over the middle of the park. And we're always going to win the game. Always going to win the game. It was so, so clear and evident that, you know, Loud were just so much better organised, structured and working hard. And the ball went into Daniel Flynn. He got turned over and you could see he looked towards the sideline. Though he indicated an injury. And five minutes later, he came off whether he was injured or not. And just everything about it, there just seems to be an undercurrent there that's 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 really poor and you know for Kildare football to be sliding down into division three as you said it, 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 sometimes you know you go down from one to two and the obvious teams come back up but some say when you go from two to three it can be difficult nearly to get back up because there's generally a couple of decent teams in division three 
So it doesn't bode well for them going into the championship. What they're and on I see the pressure there that they'll be under now, Kieran, to make a Leinster final just to play Sam Maguire football. It'll be even worse than the pressure they've been facing in the league. Yeah, and I wouldn't be backing them either for it, Jack, to be honest. Uh, Westmeath and Lowe would fancy their chances yeah. against I Kildare every day. And are, are well ahead of them at the moment. Yeah. So it, 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 it's, no, it's not looking good. Going into the Leinster championship in that regard. And, and, I said this before, like I've been in dress rooms, you know, being back in Dublin dress rooms where we were we were in a bit of turmoil and stuff like that. And and it's 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 very, very, very difficult to turn it around. Uh, if you have, you know, you're looking for leaders in your dress room, but if you have some of the more experienced players and some of the bigger players in that dress room and they're not pulling the same way as a management team, you're goosed. Haven't got hope. You're not going to bring the younger, inexperienced lads with you, and it's very, very hard to turn that turn that ship mid season. So it it just doesn't look well, and it's 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 sticking out in the manner of the performances. Mm, worrying, worrying yeah. for them. Um, before we finish up chatting on the football at the weekend, I know myself and Rory were kind of chatting earlier about one of the other key interesting things over the weekend was just seeing the new rules coming into play, Kieran. And we were chatting with Neil earlier about a win in the Hurling in particular, where now if a player takes off his helmet, he has to uh, come off the field of play immediately and be assessed. The other thing that you saw coming in now is the treatment of injuries. Now that we're asking referees to define whether it's a serious injury or not. Like the new rule basically says players who are seriously injured can continue to be treated on the field of play. However, if a play if a player is not seriously injured and requires treatment, they have to be treated off the field of play and can only return at the halfway line when there's a break in play at the referee's permission. And yeah. I think they're going to, referees are going to find it hard now to decipher what's a serious injury and what's not. Yeah, it's a very tricky one, Jackie. And um, we saw evidence of it in a club game yesterday morning. Um, and I think firstly, firstly, you have to say that this issue definitely had to be looked at, right? Because particularly the black card, the nonsense that was going on during the 10 minute black card period. And uh, you would hope that that's certainly an area where referees will clamp down on it when people are trying to trying to run down the clock. But it's a very, again, it's putting more pressure on referees. And it's it's a very vague that the referee has to determine whether it's a serious enough injury to be treated on the field. Or if if he determines that it's not a serious injury and he orders the player off the field, so you're back into the interpretation around injuries, medical stuff. So it's 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 tricky. It's very tricky. And and we saw I saw it in club game yesterday, uh, where you know a player it happened twice. A player went down injured, and it wasn't during any black par- car period. And the player was asked to leave the field. And when he left the field, the team like you, the ball can be in possession. Possession for two, it's about three or four minutes, wasn't yeah. it? Four minutes, yeah. And the opposition went up and got a score. Um, and it happened a second time. And then, ironically, it happened the third time where the, one of the same players that had come off had got a ball, a smack of a ball in the head. And he stay up, stay yeah. up. Yeah. Uh, and 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 the referee actually that time didn't order him off. And you also had the the, the issue on the sideline where physios are are being told not to kind of go onto the field because the referee might determine that it's a an injury that he needs to remove the field, move go from the field of play. So it's very it's it. it and then you had sidelines uh, shouting, "Don't don't go down, don't, don't go down, down. Yeah. stay up, stay so up." It, it, was, it, it was bizarre. It, now it, it probably hasn't flowed through yet, but it will be very like this. Imagine you know. Last minute of the game, or two minutes, you know, into injury time, or and or and you have a black card, and someone else goes down injured, and the player is removed from the field. All all of a sudden, you're down to thirteen. So, it's it, again, there's a grayness in it that the referee is being asked to determine how serious the injury is and whether the player is to leave the the field of play. It's gonna be, it, it's gonna be very very tricky, um, and how how they interpret that, um. So we'll see over the next few weeks, but it comes with a health warning. Yeah, <laughs> it does like everything, Rory. But the biggest thing I keep saying this, even when I'm just chatting with friends of mine, how are we not helping them more? You know, like the referees are just being asked to look after so much in the modern game. And I think even though I really fundamentally believe this is coming from a good place, like most of the rule changes yeah. genuinely are, I just still wonder how it's going to be enforced. I think it's exactly that. This there's the merit and the intention behind this is a good thing. But 
It's like any rule that you bring in. It's the law of unintended consequences is the yeah. one that trips you up. And I suppose this is what will probably play out now in the next couple of weeks. And I was at that same game that Wheeler was at yesterday. And the two of us were like, whoa, because we only realized when we were there, referee that was in charge, really good referee. And um, he obviously let the players know beforehand that this rule had come in. It was in effect from that morning. So this was the first time. Now, it looked to me like he more or less abandoned a sort of a blanket application. But what you're expecting, what you're ultimately expecting the referee to do is to become a doctor on top of every on top of everything else. And I'm not entirely sure if that's going to, you know, like if that's sustainable, like as well as that, what if he makes a bad decision? What if somebody gets a serious injury and he thinks the player is play acting and something serious actually happens to that player afterwards? Or, or the physio doesn't run on. Or the physio yeah. doesn't go out to treat him, <laughs> you know, because the sideline are saying, don't go on, don't go on, because we'll end up being down to 14 players if you go on to treat him because he's on the floor. Leave him, leave him out there. You know, some managers that might say that, you know. So I, yeah, it's a funny one to just land in right now and say, right, this is in now. Again, you know, right ahead of championship as well. It could cause some difficulties. Mm. Definitely one to watch over the next few weeks. That is for sure. Uh, lads, we're going to have to leave it there, but uh, thoroughly enjoyed that. Good league overall, Kieran. I think. You know, and looking forward to good league finals. I think, you know, championship might have to wait a little while to bubble, but I think we've been handed some pretty decent games to look forward to next yeah, weekend. The, the league has got a lot of passion. Um, I've always liked it as a, as a competition. It, there's no doubt about Jackie. There is an element of devaluation because of the season we have. Um, yeah. It was pretty evident in Division One. We need to look at that. We need to like you can you can it, it's beginning to flow through where managers are talking about the the load that's on players and stuff like that. We got to look at that. We got to bring the value back to it because Division Two, Three, and Four were as competitive as as always, and uh, but Division One probably you know lacked that bit of bit 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 of. Uh, ambition and appetite from some teams, and that's something that we got to look at because it is—it's it, a brilliant competition. You know, you miss it now the next the next few weeks, but um, the fact that we've a couple of brilliant games next weekend to look forward to. Brilliant! I tell you, you'll be pining for it now when you're looking at the Leinster Championship in a couple of weeks. <laughs> trust me. Uh, all right, look, we will leave it there. Myself and Rory will be back on Thursday to look ahead to those league finals next weekend. We will talk to you then. Possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road. And that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. It's over the bar.